together in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit in serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, and practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. And do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. And never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You may be seated and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we delight to gather to hear you speak to us in your word. Your commands are high and holy because they come from the high and the holy one. Your commands are glorious because they reflect your glory and lead to your glory when your people live them out. And indeed, though you speak as the one who is high and holy and dwells in that exalted place, who is majestic in glory, and yet we cannot read these commands without knowing that we are insufficient in ourselves to fulfill them, even more realizing that each of these has been lived out in the flesh with perfection in you, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, now at the right hand of the Father. Indeed, when we are conformed to your image, we are conformed to the image of Christ. For it is there that the perfect will of God, the perfect righteousness of God, has been lived out for us as both our salvation and as our example. And yet, O oh God, what could the mercies that you have shown to us produce in our heart but that we show mercy? What could should the grace that we've received produce in us if we understand it but that we would show grace? Indeed, it is as you taught us, our Lord, that if we do not forgive, we will not be forgiven. If we do not love the brethren flowing from our love for you, then... We have not yet tasted that grace divine and that love divine in the glories of the cross. And indeed, this is what you are commanding us, that whatever gift you have given to us, we apply it with diligence to the body, to those we are called to love. That whatever gift you have given to us in sphere of ministry, we operate out of our love for you because of the love we've received. Indeed, we have received every ministry in mercy. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would, at the base of it all, keep us diligent to pursue that most fundamental command, that most fundamental perspective of our entire life, and that is that it belongs to you as an expression of worship. Daily in the Old Testament, they brought sacrifices, they brought what was costly. They brought what would cost them something to express, to express their worship to you. They brought it daily to sacrifice it at an altar, to give it to a priest that it could be offered up before them. And yet we no longer do that, Christ, because you have given us an offering once and for all in the giving of your body, in laying it down as a sacrifice, the perfect and the holy one bearing our sin on the cross and rising from the dead for us. And in the same way, you command that we give our bodies, all of who we are, our bodies, not just physically, but our minds, our will, our affections, to you as a living sacrifice each day, that we lay it down in your service and so prove to our own hearts and to our own satisfaction and joy that your will is good, that it is acceptable, and that it is perfect that we would not be conformed to this world which in every way vies for our affection and our attention, which calls us to think its thoughts after it, 
which causes us to follow its ways, to do its will. But we are bound to the will of another, to your will, O God. We are bound to your truth, and you teach us what is right, what is good, and what is beautiful. You teach us how to live wisely in this world. You teach us to long for those things that are worth longing for, and ultimately, that is to be with you in glory forever. This is how we cannot take revenge. This is how we can be wronged and not seek to wrong others in response. This is how we can receive evil and return good. This is how we can be mistreated and know that wrath is not ours to seek, but to leave it to the hands of a perfectly just God. This is how we can walk faithfully in this world. Give us grace to open our eyes to behold the wonders of the gospel. Give us constant convicting and empowering motives to serve you in this world. And Father, we know that this is all of grace. We've been rescued by grace. We live by grace. It is your grace that we sing, and it is to eternal grace that we will delight in and long for in our hearts. And so use this service, use this morning to prompt us toward that end. And Father, we do remember, even as we, according to our culture, remember to set aside a day to honor fathers. We pray that we as fathers would be examples of this. When we stumble, we would confess and stand again, and that we would love our families well, and that you would enable us to do this, reflecting our perfect Father in heaven. And it is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.
Amen. Our shelter and our rest, our strength in time of trouble is in the Lord alone. Well, stand with us once again, and the next song follows a very similar theme. Let's take for a moment to think about the words to this song. It talks about Christ as our intercessor, our help, our redemption, and our righteousness. Verse 3 says, Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased with his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high with Christ, my Savior, and my God. so grateful. Well, children are dismissed to Children's Church. 
And Pastor Joey, would you come preach to us from God's Word? Okay. Well, thank you. Well, as usual, why don't we take just a few moments uh, to begin meditating even on the words we just sung and ask the Lord, who is at the right hand of the Father for us, to open His Word to us in the next few moments we have together. Father, these are great truths. They are put in the form of a song and verse set to music. The glorious truths that your word unfolds for us, even the glorious gospel that we've been reading about through the book of Romans, but that we see anticipated all the way from Genesis and accomplished in Christ and then fulfilled ultimately in the new heavens and the new earth. And all because we have a sinless Savior who died for us, with whom we are, by the Spirit, in union with. We are justified by your righteousness, O Christ. We are sanctified by your life and by your Spirit. And we will ultimately be glorified in the resurrection and how we long for that day. Teach us now in our moments together that we have to hear you speak to us from your word. We ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And we are going to find ourselves again in the uh, verses 18 through 29 at the church of Thyatira. This is our fourth message. We're going a little bit slower here. We're not going to go this slow with every church, but we are here. We're going to look today, this morning, at his uh, call to repentance, finish looking at his call to repentance, and then his commendation for those who were faithful. And next week, we'll wrap it up with his covenant promise to them. And we are going to take a week uh, next week to look at that alone, simply because the promises are so glorious, they're so comprehensive, they're so wonderful that we don't want to rush through them this morning. And so the overall message of Christ to the church of Thyatira is, of course, as we've mentioned, it is to confront sin in your midst, to not tolerate false teaching, to be committed to the truth, to not compromise with the culture. That is, of course, a warning, as with all of the warnings to the church at Thyatira, it is a warning to the church throughout the ages until the consummation of the age when Christ returns in power and in glory. And we certainly can see the failure of the church, the professing church throughout her history, not merely with the church here in the first century whom Christ is addressing, but the church throughout all of the centuries and throughout the ages and certainly even to our day. And nothing will change. The warning will be necessary again all the way to the end. So let's read our passage one more time, beginning in verse 18 down to verse 29, and then we'll... Look at it together more closely. Verse 18, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds." And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, do not hold, and who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you 
Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has ears, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And as I noted, we began last week with Christ's call to repentance to this church who was tolerating false teaching. They were already, as we noted, compromising by allowing the woman Jezebel to have a place of authority, to have the voice that she had within the church, influencing the saints and the servants of God to go down paths of compromise, paths of sin, particularly compromising with the culture around them in a way that caused them to not only commit acts of immorality, but also to be unfaithful to the truth of the gospel of Christ. They were acting in self-interest rather than in the interest of Christ. He said in verse 21 that I gave her time to repent, and we noted there that the patience of Christ, that he bears long with sinners. This is the very character of God all the way from the beginning again of Genesis, from the fall of Adam and Eve to the end of history. God is patient with sinners. He gives them time to repent, to consider their deeds, to turn from their evil ways. And so he did with those who were in Thyatira. But she was unwilling to repent. She was unwilling to turn away from her sin and those who were following her. And that is the very characteristic nature of those who are outside of Christ, that there is an unwillingness to repent. There is an unwillingness to turn to what is right. And there's an unwillingness because if someone is unregenerate, there is no beauty in the gospel. There is no beauty in the face of Jesus Christ. And there is a beauty in the world, and there is a beauty in sin, and so to them. And so she was not willing because her heart was hardened and it was dead in trespasses and sin. But nonetheless, he warns and he calls to repentance, and he gives opportunity to turn from evil to trust in his salvation. And so he says here, then in verse 21, he gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her morality. Verse 22, behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds, and I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And so he warns her. He says, I'm going to throw you on a bed of sickness. And we noted that that's probably the best translation. It refers primarily to a time of suffering. There is going to be difficulty. There is going to be hardship that comes, some significant and severe suffering because of her failure to be faithful to the gospel. Those who commit adultery with her, and there we noted that it's not necessarily that they had a physical relationship with her, of course. Here he transfers the, the meaning of that idea, of that term, to mean spiritual unfaithfulness. That is a common indictment of the Lord against his people, and they're spiritually unfaithful, that it is adultery. And so he addresses those here who have been unfaithful to the gospel. And the warning is, if they don't repent, severe judgment is going to come. And let's pick it up there, beginning in verse 23. But before we do, let me note this, that this is the teeth of the gospel call. This is what gives it its force. There is the beauty of the gospel call, the beauty of Christ, the beauty of reconciliation, the beauty of forgiveness, and the sweetness of it. It is the sweetness of the glory of the offer of grace in Christ that draws the sinner to faith. But it is also a message of judgment. It is a message of warning. You will remember that throughout, even in the, the Apostle Paul's life, that he says the gospel is to be obeyed. It, to not obey the gospel, to not believe in Christ, is to disobey God. It is, in the words of John, to call God a liar. And so this is the teeth of the gospel. The gospel isn't merely come to Christ to be forgiven, it is also to be escape the wrath to come. It is the glory of grace. And it certainly isn't a call to come to Christ merely, as we hear so often, to meet some felt psychological need, to give some never-ending source of comfort, to make Christ a constant guide in life, a help to reach your full potential, or simply to be religious, to be a better person, or be a more spiritual person. There are all kind of calls and reasons given to turn to Christ, but none of those are the ones that Scripture gives. The warning that he gives here 
is repent and come to Christ because if you do not then you will be judged and you will experience severe judgment. The gospel is just as much a call to repentance from sin to God, from a position of condemnation to reconciliation. It is, in the words of John the Baptist to the religious leaders, to escape the wrath to come. We remember Paul's words that those who are outside of Christ in Ephesians 2-3 are children of wrath. In Ephesians chapter 5, I think it's around verse 7, he says, The sons of disobedient are to escape the wrath that is to come. And here is the warning that Christ is giving to those in his church that are unfaithful to him. Now we noted and ended last week with all these believers or unbelievers and the distinguishing mark of whether someone is a believer or an unbeliever, an unbeliever who is simply following the reality of their own heart and false teaching or a believer who gets tripped up. And the difference is repentance. The one who is truly belongs to Christ will feel the conviction of the warning and repent and turn back. The one who does not will not. And so he says, unless they repent at the verse 22, and if they don't, I will kill her children with pestilence. I will kill her children with pestilence. In other words, he would rather their repentance, but is sharpening his sword for judgment if they remain rebellious. He calls them here her children, a reference to those who have succumbed to her teaching, who have succumbed to her influence, who have bought in to her error. These are spiritual children produced by false teaching. It's possibly the same group that he mentioned earlier of those who committed adultery with her, or it may be a different group. It may be those who not merely got tripped up, but have fully imbibed completely her error and her teaching. In either case, whether it's the same group or a different group, in verse 23, the warning is severe, I will kill her children with pestilence. It's actually the word thanatos, which is death, usually translated death, I will kill her with death, her children with death. Interestingly, it's a term used later in Revelation, translated also pestilence there, they're referring to these judgments that are going to come at the end when Christ unleashes his judgments upon the world at the last days of this age. And for that reason, some say here the warning really is to this final wrath, this eschatological wrath, but it's probably better here to see it as a wrath that's going to come, a death that's going to come, particularly upon those who are in Thyatira. Yes, there is the ultimate eschatological wrath for all who reject Christ and fall into error, but here he's not referring to that so much as he is referring to there is a judgment that's going to come upon you, those who are hearing the original address, swiftly. But notice what he says the purpose of the judgment is in verse 23. He says, It is so that all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, so that all the churches will know, so that his people will know that he is the Lord of the church and will hold us accountable. And I notice just a couple of points here. Christ is concerned about the holiness of his church. Christ is concerned about the holiness of his church. He's intimately concerned. We've mentioned many times where that's been demonstrated to that I've mentioned several times and you're familiar with them in the past is when he began and established old covenant worship with the, the, the Levitical priesthood and the tavern, uh, the tent of meeting and all of those kind of things. You remember Aaron's son were worshiping. They offered strange fire in Leviticus chapter 10 and fire came out of the tent of meeting and it consumed them. It killed them. And then he told Aaron not to weep for his sons and so dis honor him. He wanted to establish right at the beginning of that worship that he was holy and as he says in Leviticus 10, and I will be treated as holy by all who come near me. And we say, well, that was the mean Old Testament God, but we have the nice New Testament God, Jesus. No, we remember as well in Acts chapter 5 when Ananias and Sapphira came and they lied to the Holy Spirit. They lied to God and immediately what did God do? He struck them both dead individually to remind the people that he is a God who will be treated as holy. And it said great fear came over all of the people, but the church began to grow. Christ has always been concerned about the holiness of his church. That's why he gave extensive instruction and illustrated it in many ways throughout the New Testament that the church is to address error and unrepentant sin. That's what church discipline is about. Church discipline is about primarily 
the glory of Christ in his church and the holiness of his church and the witness of his church. Certainly the restoration of the brother is at the heart of it, but even over that is Christ's concern for his church. Note secondly here, that Christ is concerned about his own glory, his own glory. Now the contemporary church, and at many points throughout our history, is not comfortable with the God-centeredness of God. It's actually opposed to the very essence of Arminianism, which has to protect at all costs the freedom of man's will to be able to choose and to be authentic. It is the very contrast of the kind of gospel that is presented in our age. We're very familiar with it. Where the great concern of God in this universe is that you would feel loved and that you would realize how loved you are. And so the great goal and the great end of everything that happens in the church is that you would be loved, that you would be cared for, that you would see how God is for you and not against you. Those are, of course, wonderful truths, but they are not the highest purpose of God in the church. It is to bring glory to himself. And that is something that men are uncomfortable with very often. I think I told you this story before. It uh, always comes to my mind with this. I mean, there's many other examples, but this one uh, comes to my mind. We, I was on a, a plane uh, flight, and I was sitting next to someone. He was actually a, he was a Christian musician. He did Christian music. He traveled around, and that's what he did. And so we were talking, and, and everything was fine. And I brought up this point, however we got there, about the God-centeredness of God. And he was so offended in it, and what would turn into a nice conversation turned into not so friendly. And then, of course, I'm thinking, how long is this flight? But, but the point is, is that was a deeply offensive point to him, that God would be ultimately concerned about God's glory, that he would be concerned about that above all else. But that is exactly what Christ is demonstrating here. And we see it throughout Scripture. We know... It's, in the book of Ephesians, that the end of the grace that we've received, God's sovereign electing grace, is that it's to the praise of the glory of His grace, is that He would receive everlasting glory for what He has done. Let me just give you one example of this, actually, out of the book of Ezekiel. And I'm going to give you two sides of this. God is glorified and concerned ultimately about His glory both in salvation and in judgment. Now, He's focusing on judgment and revelation, but let me give you one example of that in salvation, which kind of brings these two ideas together as well. In Ezekiel chapter 36, of course, He is addressing a nation who is going to experience His judgment, exile from the land, the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem, and so forth. And then God, of course, never leaves them without hope. And he says, yes, this judgment is going to come, but I ultimately will restore you. And if we were to take that into the contemporary church and a lot of the contemporary popular thinking, we'd say, well, God is going to restore you because he wants you to see how valuable you are. He wants you to know how worthy you are, how valuable you are, how much he wants you to be the center of his affections. Would you agree with that? I mean... In that lot, how the gospel is presented? Listen to how God describes it, his future salvation to his people. He says, I have concern in verse 21 for my holy name, which the house of Israel has profaned among the nations where they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. And then he says, I'll take you from the na nations, I'll gather you, I'll sprinkle you with clean water, I'll write my law in your heart, I'll put my spirit within you, and you will walk in my ways. But then he says, even at the end of that, so that you will be ashamed of what you did, he says in verse 31. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight and your iniquities and your abominations. The point is, is that Christ acts and God acts for the glory of of his name. His salvation is ultimately for the glory of his name. Yes, we rejoice in his love, but the end is that he would receive the glory, that he would be the center of the affections of his people. He acts that way in judgment, too, for the glory of his name. Ezekiel chapter 5, let me just read you a couple of passages. Verse 13. 
After warning them of the judgment that's going to come, he says in verse 13, Thus my anger will be spent, and I will satisfy my wrath on them, and I will be appeased. Then they will know that I, the Lord, have spoken in my zeal when I have spent my wrath upon them. He says in chapter 6, the slain, verse 7, the slain will fall among you and you will know that I am the Lord. However, I will leave a remnant for you, will have those who escape the sword among the nations when you are scattered among the countries. And then those of you who escape will remember me among the nations which they have carried captive, how I have been hurt by their adulterous hearts which have turned away from me, and by their eyes which have played the harlot after their idols, and they will loathe themselves in their own sight for the evils which they have committed for all of their abominations, and then they will know that I am the Lord. I have not said in vain that I would inflict this disaster on them. Thus says the Lord, clap your hands, stamp your foot, and say, Alas, because of all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, which will fall by the sword, famine, and plague. He who is far off will die by the plague. He who is near will fall by the sword. He who remains and is besieged will die by the famine. Thus I will spend my wrath on them. Verse 13, then you will know that I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Look at the end of verse 14 as he goes on. Thus they will know that I am the Lord. He repeats that phrase, I think, approximately 85 times in the book of Ezekiel, that they will know that I am the Lord, that they will know that I am the Lord, and I will be glorified among the nations. Same in Revelation. After, he says in verse chapter 14, Verse 7, and he said with a loud voice, a flying angel who had the gospel just before mentioning the doom and the destruction that is to come upon the beast. He says this, and he said with a loud voice, verse 7, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the springs of water. Chapter 15, verse 8, fallen, fallen. Is Babylon the great? She who has made the nations drunk because of the wine of her immorality. Excuse me, verse 15, it says, The temple was filled, also referring to this judgment to come, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven, the plagues of the seven angels were finished. Chapter 16, verse 9. Men were scorched with fierce heat. They blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. One more, chapter 19, verse 1. He says this, And after these things, after the destru destruction of Babylon, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Verse 2, Because of his judgments are true and righteous. And he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. The point simply is this, that God is concerned about his glory. He's concerned about his glory, and when he acts in judgment, he wants his people to know, and he wants all of the churches to know. And here he's not even saying all of the world to know and all of the culture to know. I want my people to know that I will deal with sin, that I'll deal with sin. In other words, if you're not going to deal with sin, I'm going to deal with sin. If you're not going to confront the error, I will confront the error. If you're not going to address the immorality, then I will address the immorality, and people will know that I am serious, that I care about my name, that I care about my glory. I care about my name among the nations. He's concerned about his glory. There was a t-shirt that said, somebody was telling me about, that said this, the Bible is not about you. <laughs> it's true. The Bible isn't about us. We're a part of the story because we bear God's image. We're a part of the story because we're the objects of his salvation, the elect, or the objects of judgment, those outside of Christ. But the story is about what God did. The story is about what God did in creating the world. The story is about what God did in allowing sin to fall and how he was going to redeem a people from it for his own glory. The story is about what God is doing in Christ, what God has done in Christ, and what God will do in the future. That's what the story of the Bible is about. We find ourselves in there. 
And so here he is, he's addressing this church and he says, look, I'm going to kill her children with death or pestilence. All the churches will know. What will they know? They will know the absolute perfection of his judgment. He says, they will know this, that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. And this is a piercing statement. It's a piercing statement. It is a reminder that his judgment is perfect. And that he will hold each accountable with equity. It really here is an application of what the description was in the beginning. That he is the risen Lord who has eyes like flames of fire. It's his piercing omniscience. But the fire represents the burning desire for holiness that will deal with sin. And so here it is among the church. He's saying there's nothing going to be lacking, nothing to miss, nothing inaccurate is in his assessment of each person. Now again, let's just notice a few things here. He says, I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. He says, I am. Here again, reflecting his divine glory as the exalted Messiah who bears the full glory of deity and the added glory as Redeemer and exalted Christ. It's the glory he spoke of in prayer to the Father in John 17, the glory that he had with the Father as the eternal Son before the world was, his eternal glory as God the Son, the glory that he had who existed in the form of God from all eternity, the glory that has always been with the Father throughout all of eternity, if we could speak that way. But it is the added glory, it also includes the, the reflected glory, the reflected glory not only of his deity, but of his deity as it was worked out through his humanity and accomplishing salvation so that now he who is the head over all of creation through whom all things were created through whom all things have been reconciled back to God in Colossians 1 he is now the one speaking from that high and exalted and holy position it is the glory that we will see one day when we are with him that he longs for us to see again in John 17 and by saying this he is reminding them that there is no escaping him he is the God as well of whom Paul said in Acts 17, in whom we live and we move and we have our being. He's the God of whom David said, where can I flee from your presence? He's God, infinite, God, eternal, infinite in relation to time, eternal, infinite in relation to knowledge, he's omniscient, infinite in relation to space, he's omnipresent. Infinite in relation to power, he's omnipotent. He is the infinite God who will indeed execute judgment. Note what else he says that he not only is reminding us of his deity, but of the fullness of his knowledge. It is a searching knowledge. His deity means that he sees through us. It's not merely of deeds, but the deepest and most hidden realities of our hearts. And it's really interesting what he says here. He says, I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. Who searches the minds and the hearts. And note here that his searching is not to discover something that he does not know. It merely emphasizes that his relationship to his people is active, it is personal, it is real, it is continual. He's actively searching his people, he's actively looking, he's actively scrutinizing the paths of those who profess his name, and of all men really. And it is a piercing knowledge as he scrutinizes, he says it's of the mind and the heart. That word translated mind, you might have a little note in your, in your Bibles, is actually the word kidney. It's a, a rare use of the term in the New Testament. He's of the kidney, you would, if you were to do literally, the kidneys and the hearts. Why does he say kidneys? That's kind of an odd thing to say. Really what it does is it reflects the nature of our humanity as being made in the image of God. The psychosomatic, sometimes it's called about nature of humanity, that we are both immaterial and material, that we both have a soul and we have a physical body, and that they are together and they are one, so the reactions of our soul find expression through the physicality of our bodies. We see that in many ways, but we can think of David, that in his sin, it, it had physical effects to him. He said, my vitality was drained away, and there, there are many other examples. But here what it means, it's a very, very 
piercing kind of description because when he says here of the kidneys referring here to the mind he's really essentially saying this as I know the deepest part of you down to what even causes your emotional reactions the deepest part of you that interacts with the world I knew everything about you everything that goes on in your mind things about you that you don't even know Kind of like Paul said, he has a clear conscience, he says, but I don't even judge myself, but the Lord judges me. Why? I don't even know myself as I ought to. The Lord knows. And so he says here that I know your mind. He searches the mind and he searches the heart. Again, the heart, we're more familiar with that. Comprehensive term. It encompasses the sum of our inner being, our affections, our thoughts, our intentions, our wants. It's out of which we live life. It's sort of the control center of our life. You watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the issues of life. Every reaction you have of life, every experience in life flows out of this place of the heart. And he's saying that's... That's what I'm searching. That's what I'm looking at. That's what I'm knowing. And my judgment then will not be in any way misguided, but it will be a perfect judgment. He's really reflecting, again, the common warning throughout Scripture. Listen to Jeremiah 17.10. He says this, Jeremiah 17.10. I'll actually go up to verse 9. He says, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Note the contrast. The heart is deceitful above all else. In other words, don't think that you're the one that can ultimately discern the reality of your heart. Because you can deceive yourself. You can deceive others, but he says in contrast to that, verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Kidneys there. Even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. I search the heart. You can deceive yourself, you can deceive others, but you cannot deceive me. You cannot deceive me. I will bring to account what is right. He says earlier in chapter 11, But O Lord of hosts who judges righteously, verse 20, who tries the feelings and the hearts... Who tries the feelings and the hearts, God knows. And that God is the risen Christ who's here speaking. So notice this. When he says that I'll try the, your deeds, I search the heart and the minds, his omniscience is not simply observation. It's not God's omniscience isn't just that he knows where you go, he knows what you look at, he knows the things that you do, like he's watching, like he's got you on some hidden camera all the time. That's not the idea of omniscience. The omniscience is much deeper than that. He knows through all of your deeds who you really are and who I really am, why you go where you go, what you truly want and design and what you do and what you say. That's what he knows. And it's worth noting here as well, uh, pausing for just a bit to make mention of this, that this same piercing and knowing knowledge of God is behind the inspiration of the Word of God. Listen to this. Again, you're familiar with this, but but it's worth noting it here. He says this in Hebrews chapter 4. Again, familiar words. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The word of God has this function. The very fact that we're reading about this is the message of Christ to his church in words written down over 2,000, nearly 2,000 years ago. Gives testimony to the Lord who speaks to his church at Thyatira is the Lord who speaks to us in the entirety of his words. Scripture exposes our motives. It reminds us of his inescapable presence. It goes with us wherever we go, discerning our motives and our actions. And so I would just pause to ask this question to you. Is this the effect of the Word of God on your heart, of Scripture in your life? 
If it isn't, if you, if you go to Scripture and Scripture is boring, Scripture is unattached or detached from the realities of your life to the things that you feel within your heart, if you hear something like that and you really don't get it because Scripture doesn't expose your motives and your intentions, it doesn't renew your mind in that way, then there's two possibilities. One is this, that you're unregenerate that you've never actually experienced the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit producing the reality of repentant faith and spiritual life. That's one possibility. And so the Scripture is just detached. It's boring. It has no connection with your real life. Other things do. Maybe certain movies, maybe music, maybe friends, maybe the world, maybe some other ideology. That connects. But Scripture is disconnected. Well, most likely then, very possibly, is because you're unconverted. Or it could be this, that you're a believer, but you have a very weak view of Scripture. Scripture, and that's why sometimes people run to psychology. They run to other things to fix all the problems. They're like, Scripture's nice and teaching me how to be a nice moral person. But when I'm dealing with real issues, real depression, real sadness, real loss, real issues of life, I go to a psychologist who rejects the sovereignty of God, who rejects the reality of the Holy Spirit, who rejects the reality of sin and redemption. Or maybe uh, somebody who claims not to reject those things, but it has no foundational place in their counsel to the church of God. But the Word of God is His Word to us that is sufficient for life and for godliness. And it's not a matter of the insufficiency of the Word of God, if that's our attitude. It's the matter of our ignorance of the Word of God, the littleness of our knowledge, the littleness that we know of what God has actually said and considered how to apply it to our life. But that aside, uh, that as an aside, look at what else he says. What is the result of his searching? It will be perfect justice. He says, I will give to each of you according to your works. I will give to each of you according to your works. Now really, this is a principle some of y'all are familiar with, with lex talionis, and it's the idea of the law of retribution. We know it sometimes as an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth out of Exodus 22, Exodus 21, verses 22. It is the idea that God gives what is equitable, what is right, what is just, what is fair according to his holy standard. That's how God judges. Listen to just a few ways he talks about that. Psalm 62, 12, And loving kindness is yours, O Lord, for you recompense a man according to his work. Proverbs 24, 12, If you say, See, we did not know this. Does he not consider it who weighs the hearts? And does he not know it who keeps your soul? And will he not render to a man according to his work? How many people live with the idea that that they get away with sin? I know. There's no sin that will not be accounted for. Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man is going to come in glory of His Father with His angels, and I will then repay every man according to his deeds, even to the Christians and to the church, 2 Corinthians. For all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Lesson in Revelation, again, chapter 14, verse 13. He says this, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors and their deeds will follow them. They are put in a positive light. He also remembers deeds of faithfulness, deeds of trust, deeds of self-sacrifice. None of it goes missed. But he remembers all the others too. All of the evil deeds of men, all of the acts of unfaithfulness, He says in verse 12 of Revelation 20, we're familiar, but this is the last execution of this judgment. He says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Verse 13, according to their deeds. And then they were judged from him. It's, it's kind of what Paul said in Romans 3, isn't it? That every mouth will be closed and all the world will become accountable to God. The perfect, the perfect holiness of the law will be upheld and every conscience will become fully aware of its, who's outside of Christ, fully aware of the disobedience to God. And when judgment is received, there will be no excuse. 
That's what he's saying here. I search the hearts and the minds of all, and each will be given according to their works. And again, this judgment reaches not merely to deed, but to the heart reality behind the deed, the motive, the intention driving it. That's why Paul tells us as Christians and saying, we don't have that kind of knowledge, so we have to be careful. He says, don't go on judging motives. He confronts the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, don't go on judging motives because you don't know what is in another person's heart. We all tend to do that. Hopefully we repent of it and seek not to do it. You don't know what is in another person's heart, he says. You can only go by what you actually do. He says, leave the motives to God. He says, therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time. Wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's heart. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Each man's praise will come to him from God and each man's judgment will come to him from God. Because he knows. One said this, the point of this self-designation is the divine acquaintance with man's real secret life, which forms the basis for an unerring and impartial judgment. So in short, there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed and every deed will be accounted for. And so he warns the church and he says, you better care about holiness and you better care about truth. You better not in any way replace your glory or what is convenient with my glory in the church, which is displayed when you uphold holiness and the truth. And so that's what we pursue. We do so in love. We do so with humility, but we do so. And in the midst of this, again, he comes back, and this is unique to Thyatira. He swings back around again. And in the midst of his warning about the judgment, he again reminds some that he's aware of their faithfulness. He says in verse 24, and this is number 6, the encouragement to the faithful. He says, verse 24, But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you, nevertheless... What you have, hold fast until I come. And again, isn't this sweet that in the midst of judgment and condemnation, Christ makes sure to acknowledge and to encourage those who have been faithful, to encourage them who have been faithful? He's not forgetful. He's not forgetful. He knows those who have rejected the seduction of the false prophetess, who have rejected the call to compromise and with sin. And so he acknowledges their faithful first, faithfulness. He says to the rest of you who are in Thyatira, to the rest of you who have not held or taken to or not know the teaching of this false teacher. They've not compromised with holiness. They didn't cave to culture. They stayed faithful to Christ amid the pressures to conform. And so they show themselves to be true believers. They show themselves to be those who truly belong to Christ. Believers, as we know, falter at times. They stumble get led astray. They need to be brought back. But that's the very evidence, isn't it, that they are brought back. They are brought back to the truth. Here, these never actually strayed. They held fast to the Word of God. And they showed themselves true believers by standing on Scripture. By standing on Scripture. They were faithful. They heard the Lord speak in His Word, and they said, that's who I'm going to follow, not anything else and not anyone else. And secondly, he notices, noticed this. He again acknowledges the reality that this is a battle. This is a battle that is more than what is observed with the naked eye. This is a spiritual battle. He says, who have not known the deep things of Satan as they call them. The deep things of Satan as they call them. And interestingly, he's noted in each of the churches so far, and he will after, that there is a spiritual reality behind what's going on. Again, we're familiar with it because Scripture will not let us escape that reality, but Christ acknowledges it directly in each church, nearly each church. In chapter 9, beginning with Smyrna, actually, he says there's the Jews that are really of a synagogue of Satan, the synagogue of Satan. He'll say the same thing about the Jewish presence in Philadelphia in verse 9. They are the synagogue of Satan. He says in verse 13 of Pergamum, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. This is spiritual warfare. This is spiritual warfare. He says, I know what's going on. There, there are other things going on here. But what does he mean here in this case when he says the deep things of Satan who have not known the deep things of Satan? 
Well, there's two likely candidates. He could be referring to Jezebel's teaching influenced by what at this point in the first century is not yet fully developed, but it's, it's on a trajectory. It's a growing form of teaching, which John also addressed in his epistle, 1 John primarily, of Gnosticism as we've come to know it. Of Gnostic thought. He could be saying that there is, this, there is this tenet of this growing Gnostic teaching that says to the church and that Jezebel's teaching is this. That hey, in order to demonstrate the glory of God, you can taste the deep things of Satan. You can go into the very layers of evil and show yourself to be able to come out unscathed. One described it in this way, and I think it's up here in a helpful way, this position. It's more likely that knowing, this author says, that knowing Satan's deep secrets is a reference to the view that in order to appreciate fully the grace of God, one must first plumb the depths of evil. Later Gnosticism boasted that it was precisely by entering into the stronghold of Satan that believers could learn the limits of his power and emerge victorious. On the basis that believers' spirituality is unaffected by what is done with the body, Jezebel could argue that the Thyatiran Christians ought to take part in the pagan guild feast, even if they were connected to the deep secrets of Satan, and thus prove how powerless evil is, is evil to alter the nature of grace. That would be kind of like those Christians who say, we can flirt with sin, we can watch this, listen to this, go there, do this, that's okay, because we want to show how our spirituality is so great that we can flirt with sin and play with sin and still come out okay. And it's possible that Jezebel had that kind of teaching and say, it's okay to go there. It's okay to go there because your spirituality, your true spirituality is untouched by that. So don't worry about it. It's only the flesh anyway. Your spirit is still secure and strong. And so don't worry about compromising. Don't worry about keeping yourself unstained by the world. That's one possibility. Another possibility is this, is that he's speaking sarcastically of Jezebel and her followers, revealing the reality of the source of their knowledge, which is the opposite of what they thought. In other words, Jezebel would have been saying, which also would follow some Gnostic tendencies, to say, hey, I have a connection with the Spirit, and I know the deep things of God. I myself am a prophetess. God has spoken to me. He has made me a voice, a mouth for His truth. And so I'm able to give you things hidden that you're not going to get from the Apostle John. You're not going to get from the other apostles. You're not going to get from the other recognized letters of Scripture at that time but you're going to get it from me. You're going to get it from me. And I have a knowledge that hasn't been revealed to you by another source. It's a knowledge that I have, and therefore I'm going to teach you. And I'm going to teach you because I know the deep things of God. I know the secret things of God. I have a secret and a hidden counsel by the power of the Spirit that is unique to me alone. Come and follow me. And it could be that that was her teaching, and Christ is sarcastically saying, she says it's the deep things of God, and those think they have a higher spirituality, that they have gone into the hidden things that is available only to a special few, but in reality, it is not of God, it is of Satan. It is of Satan. That's another possibility, and I think it's probably the right one. One describes it this way, that position. The claim to know the deep things of religion may have provided Jezebel and her Nicolaitan group with her, their justification for ethical license, that is to ignore the calls for holiness and participate in sinful activity. They regarded themselves as spiritually mature and able to discern more readily the truth as they saw it. But that's, that's most likely what was going on here. The fact that he mentions the synagogue of Satan twice in reference to the Jewish places of worship and the unlikely prospect that a teacher would have openly stated to participate in the deep things of Satan makes it more likely here than that he's being sarcastic. It's a sarcastic remark. And he's saying, you think you have a deeper knowledge of God, but in fact, you're wrong. You're wrong. We can see that paraded on the TV, can't you? TBN those who come out of the word faith movement and those kind of things. God gave me a word of knowledge and they go on and spout silliness and stupidity and evil. God gave me a word of knowledge, follow me. God gave me, I'm a special teacher. God told me, God revealed to me, God said to me. They're not going to scripture for that. It's their special relationship with God. 
but it's not of God. It's not the things the Spirit of God produces. Remember, we noted last week when it's of the Spirit of God, it's going to be according to the Word of God and it's going to produce godliness. It's going to produce humility. It's going to produce holiness. It's going to produce love. It's going to produce faith and persevering grace. That's what it's going to produce among God's people when it's from God. Not the nonsense that we see around us, not what Jezebel's teaching was producing, which was compromise and sin and turning away from apostolic doctrine because it was the spirit of Antichrist. So we see that. And again, I want to make just another brief aside here to notice, and we could do this at other points, but I want to hear, and it is this, that the reality of spiritual warfare, the reality of spiritual warfare, now we, many of us are aware of that, so I, I would dare to say we don't necessarily always think of that as much as we ought to when we think of the other things working behind the scene. We certainly don't always apply that knowledge of spiritual warfare to the culture around us and to the world that he warns us of that's operating on the principles of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. We think how undiscerningly we are with media. That's the big thing in our age. With music and TV, with the ideologies that are out there. These are not neutral. They're not just coming from the minds of men. They have a spiritual source. And, the, and Scripture is constantly pointing us back to that. I mean, think about it. The very beginning of Scripture is about that. He says to the serpent, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. Enmity, what are the seeds? They are two lines of people with two spiritual realities. Those who are of Satan and under his rule and under the dominion of darkness and those who are of God and under his rule and have experienced his redemption. That's exactly what Paul was talking about too. How do we apply the glories of salvation and the mercies of God when we're not conformed to this world but transformed by the renewing of our mind? And that's hard for us in some ways, and particularly since the Enlightenment, that we live in a secular, anti-supernatural culture, by and large, who wants to adopt a framework, a secular mindset. And a secular mindset is necessarily a materialistic mindset, that all I can see, touch, and handle is all that is. Anything that is relegated to a spiritual world and a spiritual reality is the superstition of our ancient fathers who were out of their ignorance. They didn't have the science advancement, so when they saw thunderstorms, they worshipped it as a god. When the sun rose, they worshipped it as a god because they didn't know anything else but to appease the gods that were out there so that they could have a better life, to manipulate their gods in some way. That's, we hear it on the news all the time. We hear that idea. We hear about the God of science. Scientism, science, legitimate science is good, right? Christians embrace that. But scientism is different. It's a secular religion. And the foundation, again, of a materialistic understanding of the universe, that matter is all that is. And Satan wants that. The idea of a devil is to them a joke. Popular definition of this, just to give you an idea of Christian philosopher, some of you may know him, J.P. Moreland. He defines in simple terms this way. Scientism is the view that the hard sciences like chemistry, biology, physics, astronomy provide the only genuine knowledge of reality. He goes on to say, as the ideas that constitute scientism have become more pervasive in our culture, the Western world has turned increasingly secular and the power centers of culture, the universities, the media and entertainment industry, the Supreme Court, have come increasingly to regard religion as a private superstition. So there's a sense in which he needs to remind us in a new, in a fresh way here reading this to say there are, there are things going on here. This isn't just a matter of preference. This isn't just an intellectual matter. This is a matter of spiritual warfare. There is a spiritual battle. You have a spiritual enemy that is opposed to Christ and everything the good. And his most effective work is done when he's ignored. Satan loves the idea of a pitchfork and a horned head. He, he loves that idea of materialistic worldview. Because then he works 
more effectively behind the scenes. But he is the spirit now at work in the sons of disobedience. And so he reminds them, he reminds us of what Paul said. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Who is ultimately behind Jezebel's teaching? It's de- demons. It's Satan. Who is ultimately beside, behind the rise of a world power in opposition to Christ? It is Satan. And so in confronting him, both the resources and the weapons of our warfare are spiritual. They are bound up in the word of God, empowered by the spirit, and encouraged along by the faithful people of God who love Christ. Note thirdly, though, here, the gentleness in his requirements. He says, it's a battle. Some of you have remained faithful. I recognize that. It's a spiritual battle. There are things going on here, but many of you have abstained from the error of this teaching. You've remained faithful to Christ. And he says to them, I place no other burden on you. What is the burden here that he doesn't place on them? What does he mean? Well, again, there's a couple of possibilities. He could be making a simple direct reference to the decision of the Jerusalem Council on Acts 15. There was some issues that came up. It was the Judaizers. These were Pharisees within the church, those who had come out of that, the legalists, who said, you have to believe in Christ and you have to be circumcised. You can read about it there in Acts 15. Paul was confronting that often. And the Gentiles had a question, and Peter goes up and says, look, we don't want to bring the law back into it because neither we nor our forefathers were able to obey that. We don't want to put a yoke on them that nobody is able to bear the law, but we stand in grace in Christ. He is the completeness of our righteousness. And so there's a discussion. The leaders, particularly James, who was the head of that council, they write a letter that goes go out to the Jerusalem churches, and they include this in the letter in verses 28 and 29. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourself free from such things, you will do well. And so it could be that he's referring to that and he's saying, look, the the decision you already know about, what's already been circulated throughout the churches, that the way that you keep yourself holy among the cultures that you live in, particularly there among those who are have a strong Jewish presence, that you abstain from those things that are offensive to Jews and from a morally impure life. It's possible, but the issue of the Jerusalem Council was different, primarily focused on how to live peacefully with Jewish communities. Here, the issue is avoiding compromise with false teaching designed to ease the the burdens of following Christ. It seems most likely then that he's saying this, I lay no other burden than this, that you keep yourself unstained from the false teaching, compromise with the culture, and remain steadfast in the pursuit of faithfulness, which he had already commended them for in verse 19. Your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance, your works that are growing more and more faithful. That's most likely what he's saying here. It certainly includes that decision. But here he's saying, look, I place no other burden on you than this, that you remain faithful. And in that sense, he's looking forward to verse 25. He says, nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. And this is the last thing we'll mention here. Hold fast, hold fast. Again, there was already some measure of this among them. That's who he's addressing to the rest who didn't go down this false teaching. Hold tightly. And in the end, this is what Christ calls us to as his church. It's what he calls us to as his church. It's what he calls us to as individuals. One word. There's a lot of things you could put in, but one word here. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. That's what he calls us, to be faithful. To be faithful to him. That's the sum of it. Be faithful in the little things and in the big things. Be faithful in the public things and the private things of your own heart. Be faithful to the truth. Be faithful to grow in holiness and obedience. Be faithful daily in your own lives as an individual and as a church to turn away from sin and to turn to righteousness, to obedience to Christ. Be faithful to serve him in the world, especially in the church where he's uniquely gifted you. Be faithful to pursue growth and holiness of his, the, of his people in love as you give your time and your giftedness to the church. Be faithful to him, holding fast to him and finishing well so that we can hear, well done, my good and my faithful servant. So that we could say at the end, like these Christians who did, with Paul, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, 
will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those all to the to also to all who have loved his appearing. And what is the reward? The reward is worth it, and that's what we'll consider next week. But this is what he calls us to individually and as a church to be faithful. At the end, we want to be faithful. We don't want to invent and be clever. We don't want to bring our own brand of anything. We simply want to be faithful to know what Christ has said and then follow him in it. We simply want to be faithful to believe his word above every other competing voice. We simply want to be faithful when we wake up in the morning to live for him in the context that he's put us. We want to be faithful to follow our savior. That's it. At the end of the day, whether it was a lot, whether it was a little, whether it was something big or whether it was something small that he called you to, it's going to be this. Were you faithful? Did you hold fast to my word? Did you believe me? Did you walk with me? Did you trust me? And what a glory it will be to hear those words because none of us is perfectly faithful, but even there we rest on him who is faithful in our behalf and so that we know that ultimately it's his faithfulness we rest on to redeem us. But he calls us to that same life to follow in his path and that's how we give evidence of his life in us. And so that's the message, be faithful. Be faithful to the end. And here's, here's an encouragement. It'll be worth it more than you even know. It will be worth it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Christ, for speaking to us and teaching us. And Lord, we do want to be faithful. Sometimes, Lord, your people get discouraged. They get discouraged because it feels like they're not doing much for you. And maybe there does need to be repentance there. Maybe there is laziness. But sometimes it's because we're looking for big things and we think the little thing that we offer and can do is not very important, but it is to you. When it's offered to you in the sincerity of faith, it is important. It is noticed by you. Lord, we sometimes feel the draw of the culture around us and how easy it is to slide into what is convenient and easy, but you call us to be faithful to spend time in your word, to be changed by it, to have our minds renewed, our affections shaped, our will directed towards what is right and what is good and what is holy. Help us to be faithful in the little things so that we'll be faithful in the big things. Help us to be faithful to you now, growing in holiness and knowing you so that when you make greater demands on our life in the future, we're ready and not caught off guard and don't stumble where we shouldn't. But we're ready because we know our Savior, because we've walked with you. Help us to follow in the line of those faithful among Thyatira who kept their garments unstained, who didn't follow the, those who were compromising. And regardless of whatever ridicule it may have brought or whatever it may have cost them in terms of finances and social standing and those kind of things, they said, we'll follow Christ because it's worth it in the end and because we love our Savior. May we follow that example. And Lord, if there are any here who don't know you, as always, we ask that you would reveal yourself to them as good and holy and righteous Savior. Reveal to them their sin and the reality of condemnation and the great and glorious truth that there's no condemnation for those who run and flee to Christ Jesus. And it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. And Jacob. Stand and we'll sing Amazing Grace. If you have your hymnal, that's 202, 202. Let's just sing the first and the fourth verse. Got that, guys, in the back? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Amen. Let's pray one last time. Father, you have given us grace. You have extended your grace. You know us deeply. You see into our minds and hearts. God, give us the ability to be faithful. Help us to be faithful in what we do, in our deeds, that we would uh, praise and glorify you and worship you through our actions, through our thoughts, through uh, anything that we uh, expose ourselves to as we um, have media or work or relationships. Just um, help us to recognize uh, you uh, alone have saved us by your grace. Uh, you alone can save us. And um, we pray for your um, blessing uh, as we go throughout this week to be faithful. Um, give us opportunities to be faithful to you and to be faithful to your mission of the gospel, that we would spread the good news, that we would have um, love for one another in your church. Um, thank you so much, Lord, for the time that we've had together this morning to sing, to worship, and to hear from your word. Um, give us blessing throughout this week. In your name we pray. Amen.